Hey, this is Malika of Evanston Live TV, and I have with me, we're changing it up a bit. We've been doing so much with the Evanston elections. We're changing it up to something that was just so refreshing. It was intense, though. What we're about to talk about was very, very intense, and I'm excited. I can't wait for you all to check out what I checked out. This documentary, you all, is called Mandela in Chicago, and... I'm fortunate I got to take a look at it and I was blown away. It actually, I was actually in tears watching it. It was like, mm -hmm. I, it took me through a range of emotions and we have with us today, the creators of Mandela in Chicago. We have Dale and Ava Greenwell. Welcome, welcome. Thank you Hello. for having us. Thank you. <laughs> yes, yes. So I'm going to play a trailer of it because the trailer really pulls you in, definitely. And I want people to um, get just a taste of it, just a taste of it. Um, but before we get started, just introduce yourselves to the world. Oh, the world. Oh, that's great. So, I, so I'm Ava Thompson Greenwell, and I'm the director of the film Mandela in Chicago. And I've been working on that project for four and a half years, actually. So it's been a labor of love, I like to say. Yes, and my name is Dale Greenwell. I'm one of the production consultants. So it's been a, it's been a long but joyous ride. And uh, thank you for having us on again, Malika. Oh, yes, thank you for telling me about this project. Um, four years. I know doing a documentary is, that is some work because you have to get the information right. I mean, did you have um, any, I know directors who do biopics and documentaries. I mean, the, the people you're doing the story on, their family members or close friends will just be on you to get the information right. Did you encounter that? Well, what I encountered is, you know, as a, as a journalist and someone who teaches journalism at Northwestern University, um, it was really an opportunity for me to do like I tell my students to do. And that is keep, keep trying until you get what you need. And I think you never actually get all the things that you need, but at some point you get enough and you have to cut it off because as we say, no matter how great the story is, if you don't finish, no one will know. And so um, I started this project in 2016 as part of the Diverse Voices and Documentary uh, Fellowship Program through Cartemquin Films. And many people will know Cartemquin Films because of Hoop Dreams and because of lots of other uh, films that they have produced. And so their goal was really to try to get more people of color uh, as directors, that is, as people who control the narrative. And so um, I started that program in 2016, did not have one piece of footage, and here I am, almost five years later, and it's a 50 minute documentary. And I, I won't say it was magic because it wasn't, it was a lot of hard work. Um, and as you'll see in the credits for those who end up watching, uh, it is going to broadcast premiere this Sunday, Valentine's Day, that's why I call it a labor of love, February 14th at 4 p.m. on WTTW channel 11. And so, um, Lots of students in the credits, lots of people. When I started putting the credits list together, I thought, oh, there are a lot of people who have been involved in trying to make this work. From the beginning, I had students who were helping me research, helping me do transcriptions. Uh, I had to reach out to people sometimes multiple times before I could reach them, but also multiple times through other people to, to get them to even be willing uh, to do the documentary and to do the interview. But I would say in the end, uh, what's the most joyous about this is giving people an opportunity to say what they need to say and form their own narrative without having somebody else form it for him, mm -hmm. for them. Unfortunately, three of the, at least three of the people featured in the documentary have passed away. Mm -hmm. And so I knew there was some urgency to get them to be able to tell their story while they still could. Mm -hmm. That is deep. Thank you for putting in that work because I learned a great deal watching that documentary. I mean, things that I didn't know was going on with Mandela and Chicago. 
Oh yeah, I, I learned a lot as well. I learned a lot as well because you know a lot of what was happening in the mid eighties and early nineties, I wasn't living in Chicago, even though I'm a native Chicago. And I remember seeing that sign in front of Trinity church that said free South Africa. I, I really wasn't that familiar with what was going on. And so it, it was a learning process for me. And there were a few things that I learned that just blew my mind. And we can talk about those later. Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm all ears. I am all ears. And Dale, you all traveled to South Africa. So what was that like? Yeah, I mean, that was an experience. Um, going to Johannesburg um, with Ava, uh, Ava and her group of students uh, was really an experience. Um, uh, as you know, uh, South Africa is 80% Black. And they immediately could tell that we were African-Americans. So uh, that- How did they feel that immediately? I'm sorry. How do they tell that immediately? I'm I don't. Curious. You know, I I, I don't know. They, I mean, we we were walking through the mall area, and a lady walked up to us and she said, uh, uh, "I you know I can tell from your skin that you're from America," and that was just I, I really don't know. I mean, I don't know. Maybe we had a certain glow, but uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, uh, Johannesburg. We saw the, you know, we saw million dollar homes, and then we saw shanty towns where you know, people were living literally in materials that they found on the side of the road, uh, no running water, uh, kerosene to heat uh, their little, uh, I guess, huts. And uh, it's just, you know, that, that wide gap of the haves and the have nots kind of stood out to me. It, it was really, it was heartbreaking to see that, you know. Um, uh, the other thing, I mean, the people were really friendly. Uh, we had people who uh, drove us around and, and they knew exactly the, the lay of the land. Um, it, it was just an amazing experience. I mean, I, I can't wait to go back. So I would say to answer your question about how can they tell, they can tell as soon as you open your mouth because your accent is not the same. Yeah. And so they are very familiar with uh, American entertainment, particularly um, music. And so when they hear an American accent, they know you're not from there. Yet, on the other hand, um, in some ways, you could, you could go to the mall and think you're at any mall in the United States because of the variety of um, people who are in South Africa. So remember, not only South Africans, but you have uh, other African uh, nations, other, other Africans who have immigrated to South Africa from all over the continent. So you have all kinds of facial looks, all kinds of names, all kinds of hair textures, all kinds of skin colors. So it really is a very cosmopolitan area. Mm, mm. And then you all had to uh, do the work on this, this documentary. I wanna play the trailer so people have an idea of what it is that we are talking about. I can't wait for everybody to see the documentary, first of all, because it is really good. You did a great job. Of Thank you. Job. Um, I'm going to play this right now, you all. This is Mandela in Chicago. This is just a trailer, giving you all just a taste of it. Uh, hold on. Of course, Zoom is about to make me look crazy. No, that's okay. It always does. You know, we can, we can always do some filler <laughs> while, while we're waiting on that, you know. <laughs> I, I you, know, you know, I visited while you're doing that, I visited, um, I think about 11 times as part of my job, um, um, co-directing the South African Journalism Residency Program at the Medill School of Journalism. And um, one of the things that um, I would do is while I was traveling there, I would try to sneak in an interview with a South African who had traveled to Chicago or South Africans who had lived in Chicago so that you could get that perspective from South Africans during that time period as well. So that was very important to me. And it was touch and go there for some of them because some of those folks I interviewed were actually politicians. And so they had just had elections there in May of 2019, I think it was. And I was able to snag a couple of those people who were running their own political parties. They were no longer involved in the um, ANC, the African National Congress. And that's, that's a conversation also for later to talk about you know, how the ANC is viewed in South Africa today compared to 1994 when Blacks got the right to vote for the first time. Mm, yeah, I wanna hear more about those conversations, what those conversations were like with the uh, politicians at that time. Okay, so I got it up. 
Here is the trailer to Mandela in Chicago. Wow, let me get a full screen of this. <laughs> if you go to the bottom, you should probably be able to get the full screen. Yeah. The bottom, bottom right. I'm like, uh, of course this will like happen now. Okay, you all is in, uh, uh, there it is to the to the bottom right, right next to the gear. So you look at the blue to the right, a little more, a little more, a little more, a little more, a little more. Keep okay. going, keep going. But it's under see that cross. Are under you able to see it? Yeah, it's under someone's face. So they're it's under uh, right Mayor there. Daly's face. <laughs> below it. Maybe it'll do it when you click on it. There it is. We're not getting any audio though. You're not hearing the audio? My name is Carol Rogers. A little bit. My name is Joan Gehrig. Okay, now it's I'm Rexy Nesbitt from Chicago, Illinois, the West Side. I'm Mike Sadiwe Elliott. I am Dr. Iva Carruthers. My name is Carol Mosley Braun. I grew up on the South Side of Chicago. There was a time when I filmed Nelson Mandela called uh, Labor Welcomes Mandela to Chicago. I first heard about apartheid when I was in Nigeria. So I learned about South Africa. Wow, really? There was no question. It was the 1990s they had become Chicago. In 1993, recognizing that since he made this trip, he very good. this incredible speech. You have been the source of strength. He was like a like a teacher and we were all like in his classroom. Awesome, awesome. I was ready for it to just play. Just keep going. <laughs> keep going with the story. Keep going with the story. Okay. Well, some, sometimes that happens with video. And if we have time later, I'll try to bring it up on my screen because you do have to click those um, um, optimized video buttons. I'm not sure if you did that or not. Sometimes an optimized sound, sometimes that makes a big difference in how it plays. Oh, that's a different one somehow. <laughs> All right. Okay. Wow. That. That is intense. Just the name Mandela gets gets me going, gets me hyped. So, what what made you decide to to pick this this topic, this particular topic? So, so that's a good question. Um, back in 2014, uh, my predecessor Lauren Guglielmi, who brought this South Africa residency program to the Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern, decided that he was going to retire, and so he asked me if I would take over the program, sort of take over his baby. He had done this program at other universities at USC, at Emory. And so I said, sure, you know, I had never been to South Africa before and had heard a lot about obviously Mandela, everybody who doesn't know Mandela, right? And so uh, when I took over the program, it meant traveling to South Africa at least once a year, sometimes twice a year, but more importantly, there's a prep course that I had to teach prior so that the students could get up to speed because they were going to go there and actually live for 12 weeks and work as journalists in some of the news organizations there. And so as part of my learning about the country, its history, its culture to prep to teach this class, um, one of the things that I noticed is that occasionally my predecessor would bring in people from Chicago, people like Prexy Nesbitt, Foneka Shoshali, who Foneka was a South African, but she married an African-American. So she has ended up living 
um, in Chicago for quite a while. And so I thought to myself, you know, here we are 10 miles from Chicago, less than that, actually, if you, if you, you know, talk about Howard Street. And a lot of the students here don't really know about the Chicago connection. And I really didn't know it was as deep. So once I started talking to Prexy, then I started talking to other people. And then he told me about other people and it, it just ballooned. So that eventually I ended up interviewing about 26 people for the documentary. And I could have interviewed many, many more. It's just that you, again, you run out of time and you run out of money. And so that's how it got started. Hmm. Wow, so how did you know where to start exactly? Cause that is- I'm getting a little feedback uh, echo. I'm not sure where that's coming from. I don't know where that would be coming from. Is that- uh, Mic check? That's better. Is that better? Okay. I don't know what you did. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what that was. Um, so where did, how did you know exactly where to begin with that topic? Well, I, I didn't really, um, but I knew that when Prexy Nesbitt, and I don't know if people know him, Prexy Nesbitt is a pretty well-known um, activist in the Chicago area who has actually, he takes uh, educational tours over to South Africa. And um, he put me in touch. One time he came to class and he brought Basil Clooney. And if anybody knows Basil Clooney uh, here in Evanston, an Evanstonian, um, he was actually at one time one of the leaders of SITSA, the Coalition for Illinois Divestment in South Africa. And this was one of the major groups that had formed in the 1980s. And its goal was not only to educate, but also to impact legislation in, as it relates to divestment. As many of your viewers will probably know, divestment was the big thing in the 1980s. Um, a lot of universities, um, I know uh, Rachel Rubin is on and, and one of the ways that she got involved was not only through Evanston Township High, High School, if I remember correctly, one of your instructors actually um, planted that seed about what was going on in South Africa. But uh, Rachel was like many uh, folks who got involved through their universities, you know, they they took courses, or maybe there was protests going on on those campuses, and once they were sort of indoctrinated with this idea that what's happening in South Africa is not only wrong, but is very similar to what has gone on in the United States, and making those connections, that's how people started joining various organizations in Chicago, and Harold Rogers, who was the one who really, really. Um, was involved in organizing Nelson Mandela's trip to Chicago in 1993. Uh, he talks about um, how he became involved when he was a graduate student in Tanzania and there were South Africans in Tanzania living in exile. And so remember, people became educated not only through their universities, but also through South Africans who were coming to the United States and coming to Chicago. You know, there's a section in the documentary where Prexy Nesbitt says, at one time, he had 78 South Africans who stayed at his house on the West Side. And, and the goal for these organizers was not just to talk about it themselves, third person, but to bring South Africans to the Chicago area so that Chicago, Chicagoans could hear firsthand what life was like in South Africa, what it was like to live under apartheid, what it was like to work under apartheid. So all that effort that they made to educate was also then to get people more involved. And they felt that as long as they could educate them, that that would be really what would cause them to see um, how wrong the system was and think that they could have some agency to actually make a difference. Um, it's, I, I wanna ask you questions, but I don't wanna give away the documentary <laughs> at the same time. I mean, I know it's not a movie, but um, it, was parts, it was parts of the documentary um, I definitely want to ask you about, and maybe I need to do research, you know, more, learn more about the history of, of what actually took place. But um, when Chicago wasn't on his, his list of places to come to, <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, that's a little, that's a little tidbit that most people probably don't know. <laughs> 
So it's like, I don't want to give too much away because I want people to, to watch this documentary. But what can you tell us of that without giving away too much? So the, 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 short, answer, the short response is that um, most of you know that as soon as Mandela was released on February 11th of 1990, shortly after that, he started touring all over the world. Remember, this was a, a global movement to end apartheid. And he came to the United States in June of 1990. He appeared on Nightline, if anybody remembers that um, ABC show that would come on with Ted Koppel. And it was a big town hall that they had. This was in 1990. And, you know, besides New York, he went to Atlanta. I remember I was a reporter in Tampa back then. And I remember them assigning me the story to cover Nelson Mandela, who spoke at one of the huge arenas in Atlanta in 1990. He went to Detroit. And so obviously you would think he'd come to the third largest city, Chicago. Why would you go to Detroit and not come to Chicago? But it turned out that those who were organizing his trip here were concerned that he wouldn't get the kind of protection that he deserved. I'll leave it right there because the teaser is you have to watch the documentary to find out why they thought he wouldn't get the kind of protection that he deserved. Remember, here's a man who had spent 27 years in prison and he wasn't the only one, let's point that out. There were lots of activists in South Africa who were also in prison with him. Remember at one point he was labeled a terrorist. Let's not forget that because there was uh, an attempt um, to blow up South Africa on the part of um, those who were involved in trying to draw attention to what was going on with apartheid. So there were some governments, as many of you know, um, during the Reagan years that really wouldn't engage um, with what was going on. The, the, it wouldn't engage with black South Africans. They were engaging with the apartheid government, but not with black South Africans who were asking for their freedom. And so coming to Chicago, you know, they just said, no, we're not gonna do it this time. But then three years later, he did come to the city. And um, as Prexy said, it was very important, but it was also a big event for the city of Chicago. And one image you'll see there in the documentary is somebody who has now become the mayor of Chicago. If you look very closely, there's gonna be an image um, of, of Lori Lightfoot, who was attending one of the dinners at the time uh, that Nelson Mandela had. And so there were lots of uh, celebrations and activities and what have you that took place when he came in 1993. But the, that first time around in 1990, they just didn't feel it was gonna be safe for him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I got the feeling uh, when he did come, uh, some people were kind of opportunists in, in him coming. I was disappointed by that. I'm not gonna give away too much. I was disappointed well, by that. I felt it when I was watching it. I felt yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, that's not that's not unusual, right? I mean, by this time, Nelson Mandela really has celebrity status. I mean, he had celebrity status while he was in prison, and, and certainly as soon as he's released, mm -hmm. he has more of a celebrity status. And not to give it away, but there is a segment there where Rachel Rubin talks about that, what the what the impact was, and. Um, you know, not really thinking that was necessarily what he wanted, but, you know, you have a lot of handlers who are around him and people who want to be seen, right, with Nelson Mandela. They want to take pictures, you know, there were no selfies necessarily back there in 1993, uh, but people still wanted to, to be seen with him. And so um, that, that sort of happens, right? It's very easy for the people who are grassroots and on the ground to sort of get forgotten when it comes time. And let's not forget, he came to all these cities to raise money for the ANC. And so if you're gonna raise money, you know, you've got to, you got to dance with the movers and shakers of the city. And that means corporations and people who are gonna help you raise money. And so that was his ultimate goal so that he could use that money for the ANC. They're, they had to prepare, remember for an election. This is 1993 and 1994, May of 1994, there's the first free elections in South Africa. And so there was still also, remember, a lot of infighting within the country as well, and a lot of violence that was taking place over who was really going to, you know, run the, who, who are the black people who are gonna run the country now? And so you had some different factions there as well. So again, him coming, not just to Chicago, but all the cities that he went to, it was yes, a thank you. Thank you for all the work that you've done to help us um, become a 
politically free country, and I do emphasize politically free because the economic piece is still a major issue, just like it is here in the United States. Um, I'm coming to thank you for that, he said, but I'm also coming to raise some money for the ANC. Mm -hmm. I remember back then they were telling us places not to uh, patron. I think like Shell gas station was one. That's right. It was a list of them. That's right. And it feels like back then we actually um, took part in that. Whereas now if you tell people, you give them a list, don't shop here because they support white supremacy, nobody's listening. They're like, mm, mm. whatever, you know. But I felt like back then, I don't know, you, Dale, do you all, I, we're, we're pretty much the same age group. You know, everybody. You, you might be, you might be younger than us, Malika. <laughs> yeah, you might be a little bit younger. <laughs> we, we all, ask, yeah. Yeah, remember no, that I mean. Time period? I'm sorry? Remember that time period? Like everybody was like, I mean, we were in protest. We, we wouldn't shop it. We wouldn't buy those products. We wouldn't shop. We were serious about well, it. You know, uh, honestly, I'm not from here. So this has been a, a learning process for me as well, just to see this, uh, this come about, you know, like they say, you know, it's not the destination, it's the journey. Mm -hmm. And just reliving this four and a half, five year journey that Ava has, has gone on, you know, I've had a front row seat and, and pitched in where I could to ensure the quality of it. Uh, we hope that the documentary conveys the right message. I think the real heroes are the, you know, the Rachel Rubens and all the people that Ava interviewed, Jesse Jackson, Jeremiah Wright, Prexy Nesbitt. Um, it's amazing, you know, the way documentaries are made. Um, you know, you, you interview these folks and they're gracious enough to sit down with Ava, um, but it's only a small piece that's in the, that goes into the, the, the documentary. Uh, we, I mean, there, there's so many stories that we could have told. We, we hope that we pulled out the best of what these amazing uh, uh, heroes and sheroes on the front line. I mean, this is well before Black Lives Matter. So uh, we're hoping that if nothing else, the documentary just, uh, you know, revive that. I mean, this, this is a season of activism, right? So we're hoping that, uh, especially for the young folks, that they see that uh, there were people doing some, putting the work in before uh, Black Lives Matter, you know, nothing against Black Lives Matter, but uh, sometimes I think uh, it, it gets lost, you know, so uh, hats off to those people. Yeah, I like to call them the social justice warriors, right? In other words, um, before Black Lives Matter, there was Chicago's anti-apartheid movement, and then you had the civil rights movement. So I feel like the anti-apartheid movement in many ways was sort of sandwiched in between uh, the civil rights movement and the Black Lives Matter movement. And each movement gets a little bit better within its own equity issues. So let's not forget that the civil rights movement was really um, men, Black men who were in the front. And, and one of the things that was really, and, and Black women were kind of behind the scenes, right? Remember March on Washington, Dorothy Height was the only woman you know, on, on the stage there. But we know that there were women who were working behind the scenes. So you get to the anti-apartheid movement and you do have women who are obviously much more involved. And you have some organizations, some uh, activist groups who want to be multiracial and, and, and have blacks and whites. And you have some organizations that are saying, no, we don't want white people involved. And so that was one of the tensions that the anti-apartheid movement had to deal with is this tension between should it be an all black movement? Should it be a multiracial movement? And as far as gender goes, at least for CITSA, the Coalition for Illinois, for Illinois Investment in South Africa, one of their goals was to have more gender parity. So they would always have a woman co-leader and a man co-leader. So that was very different than what we saw in the civil rights movement. Fast forward to the Black Lives Movement, the, the people, at least from a national perspective, who founded the organization are Black women. And so you've had a real sea change from the civil rights movement and only Black men out front to the Black Lives Matter movement, where you have Black women who are in leadership roles. And so I think watching that historical change, that change over time, is really something important that we should um, pay attention to and take note of. Mm -hmm. That's interesting about the uh, whether or not to have white people a part of the movement to help. Should it just be all black people in the movement? Um, that has been a big discussion, even just right here in, in Evanston. Absolutely. 
Um, and, and I think that's the point is that we can learn from these activists mm -hmm. that some of these issues are ongoing. We can learn from them, but more importantly, I think Dale um, hit it on the head. My goal for this documentary is that number one, we document, that's why it's called a documentary, the role that Chicagoans played in organizing, in going to jail, in protesting. I mean, you know, you know how cold it is outside today. And, and you could see some of that footage in there, you know, you could see the smoke coming from people's mouths. They're protesting out on Michigan Avenue in front of the South African consulate in January, and it is cold because, you know, our winters back then were a lot colder than they are now. I'm hard to believe maybe for some people, but I, I can remember the blizzard of 79 and how cold and how much snow we had. And so to have people be committed, and this was pre-social move, uh, social media, remember? So you're not, you know, putting something on your social media site saying, join me on Michigan Avenue. You, you got flyers that you're putting out. You got phone calls that you're making to try to organize people. And they would have consistently these um, protests on Michigan Avenue in front of the council every Thursday for like straight for like a year. I mean, so the sustainability of something like that is also, I think, noteworthy. And it's important for us to say, again, it's not a moment, it's a movement, right? For it to be a movement, there has to be some sustained effort and some sustained attention. Um, again, there were arrests. Chicago had uh, a very pivotal lawsuit, and I won't give it away because I want people to watch the documentary that's going to be important. Um, and that was really um, life changing, not only for those who were arrested, but also for other movements around the United States, a particular nuance in the law that they used. That's important. But I think my hope is that the documentary would be a catalyst for having cities like Chicago and regions in South Africa re-engage with one another. We have a new generation of people who they don't know much about the anti-apartheid movement. And that's obviously in South Africa, they know a lot about it. But even there, it's very easy if you're not constantly being taught and told to forget about the struggles. I want children in schools in the Chicago area to know there were people right in your backyard who stood up for justice. And those people did that so that South Africa could have a more equitable economic system as well as a political system. Well, like I said, we're still working on the economic part, but the fact is you can't really have the economic piece until you have some political power as well. So getting this into the schools would be my hope and my dream so that it becomes sort of required viewing of school children in the Chicago area. And that includes in Evanston as well. Because as we know, quite a few of the people in the documentary have Evanston connections. They either were raised and grew up in Evanston or they live in Evanston still today. Mm -hmm. um, we have Rachel Rubin on. I didn't know if she wanted to speak or not. <laughs> it's, is, is Rachel speaking tonight or? She stand low in the cut in the back. There she you is. know, I, I just thought I was going to be listening in today, and I, I don't know how I got the link with the speakers. <laughs> um, well, Rachel, I mean, you're here. Your name keeps coming up. So it'd be, <laughs> great to hear, be great to hear from you. Well, you know what, maybe, um, Rachel, if you could talk about um, your time at Evanston High School, I remember the story you told about, I think it was a teacher who, who kind of planted that seed of, and, you, and I think it was also your, your parents, if I remember correctly. Yeah, well, I mean, I grew up in a, in a home where we talked about what was going on in the world. And I learned about, you know, and I, and I grew up, my, my parents, especially my mom, was very involved in civil rights. And so we made those connections between civil rights and and you know international struggles and black liberation and and colonialism um but uh in high school i had a very interesting uh teacher uh you could take in high school at evanston high school at that time you could take straight a separate course for history and a separate court for course for english or you could take something that was called combined studies which was English and history in a double period. And it would combine the history with literature. And I had, I think this must have been my sophomore year, a very uh, interesting and forward-looking uh, teacher. And 
you know, we would read uh, poetry and, and literature from international authors from all over the world. And I remember him talking about uh, apartheid and that was probably the first time I heard the term. And I was in high school from 72 to 76. So maybe this was in 1973 or something like that. And then the conversation started coming up at the dinner table. And then I went to college down at University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. And we started, I wasn't a, I wasn't a so-called founding member. Uh, this was mainly, I think, started by seniors. And I was like a freshman or sophomore. But I was one of sort of the first members of the Champaign-Urbana Coalition Against Apartheid, or KUKA, I guess. And we had to sit in at the... In the, at the president's office to try to get them to divest the university's um, uh, pension dollars in South Africa. And then that carried on after college when I moved back up to Chicago for medical school. And uh, once I was out from sort of the oppression of medical school, <laughs> of being uh, busy with no time to think or do anything except be in school, um, and once I was in residency, even though I had no time, I still felt sort of liberated in that I was working at Cook County Hospital and I felt like I had sort of found my home in, in terms of my medical work um, and got involved uh, soon after the uh, uh, Coalition uh, for Divestment, the uh, Coalition, Coalition for Illinois Divestment from South Africa. And then it sort of became full circle because I testified at hearings. So this was in maybe 84, 85, something like that. I actually testified at uh, Board of Trustee hearings for this University of Illinois um, and the state getting them to divest. And I could then speak as an alum of the university saying, you know, what the hell are you still doing? You know, we've been fighting for this now for almost a decade and you still haven't divested. So, mm. and went on from there. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for that, Rachel. Yeah, and, and I think, but I think Rachel's story really demonstrates the importance of young people being exposed to these topics and having somebody in their lives who are really gonna help them think critically about this and how what's happening 8,000 miles away is still related to what's going on in your own community. Mm -hmm. And so that again is my hope that this will kind of reignite those conversations. I know a lot of classrooms are certainly having conversations about Black Lives Matter, but it's always important to look at the historical trajectory of these organizations and say, you know, until some of these things are addressed and dealt with, there's always going to be a new generation that says, enough. I'm not going to put up with this anymore. And I am going to protest, whatever that method of protest is, these things that are injustices and these things that are wrong. And so that means also for us as parents, right? If we have children, um, the fact that Rachel's parents were having these conversations. Um, now, I know that there are some families that they're not having these conversations because they're just trying to make ends meet, right? Um, and I know that's a reality for a lot of parents who maybe haven't been able to have these kinds of conversations at, at the table, sometimes but it, it takes all kinds, right? Sometimes the conversation is too ugly. Absolutely it is. You're right about that. You're <laughs> right about that. On how real it is out there in the world. And it can be very traumatic, right? To have that conversation also. Mm -hmm. That's true too. Mm -hmm. And uh, I call it apartheid. I'm hearing throughout the documentary, they pronounce it apartheid. Right. It depends. Either one is fine. <laughs> okay. Right. I'm supposed to look up the pronunciation. I like apartheid. <laughs> I know Rachel pronounces, as a part, <laughs> pronounces it apartheid. Okay. Um, I've heard both. Okay. So um, I remember hearing and my family talked about apartheid. And I mean, we took part in, you know, making sure that we didn't shop at certain places that supported apartheid back then and um it was a part in the documentary again i don't want to give away too much but it was a gentleman in the documentary who described how this one man this one white man said boy you really know how to treat your yes nid yeah. 
E that, was, that was Rob Rob Peterson. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So so this is a white South African yes. who has come to Black Chicago, living in Hyde Park, and so they're experiencing prejudiceness and discrimination both both ways, right? As uh, when, when Black people uh, would find out that they're from South Africa, Black people would think, well, all white people in South Africa must you know, live and must be putting their economic foot on Black people. And again, it, it's surprising when they say, well, oh, no, we're, we're ANC supporters. You know, we actually believe that you know, uh, Black people should have the right to vote. But then when he goes as a white man to the suburbs and talks to white people, he gets a different impression of what white people think about black people in Chicago. So it's, it's, I, I thought that story was so telling about um, how blacks and whites uh, interact with one another, another in Chicago. I mean, and we know Chicago is still one of the most segregated cities in the nation yes. and um, the most economically dramatically different. And I think Dale talked about this. Uh, they call it the Gini coefficient, which measures the, disparate incomes of countries. And South Africa has one of the um, highest Gini coefficients. I don't even know if we even use Gini coefficient here in the United States to um, measure disparity, but I'm guessing if we did, Chicago, and I'm from Chicago, I grew up on the south side of the city, um, might have a, a relatively high Gini coefficient as a lot of urban areas do. And so um, this is just an opportunity to say, Hey, we need we need some news that tells us that when people protest, when people organize, when the people get active, things can happen. Because I think sometimes people feel as though, well, what can I do? And that may not be your thing. Activism may not be your thing. It may be something else that you want to do. Maybe in, you like you said in terms of boycotting stores. I think now what we hear more today is buy black as opposed to boycott stores. It's let's so it's a more affirmative. Let's let's prop up those black businesses that are having a hard time for a variety of reasons, and so that may be your way of of protesting is to say I'm going to encourage everybody I know to buy from black stores because they need the customers um, to to really survive, and I'm going to encourage my white friends and my white colleagues to also buy black because it's important that they also try out the products that black businesses have. So I think whatever methods you choose to be active, the main thing is just be active, you know, do something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you all travel, and I know I gotta let you all go, but I, I love this documentary. I just, I just got a couple more questions, please. <laughs> go right I'll, ahead. I'll go in a couple of minutes. When you all went to South Africa, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Um, I know you were mainly dealing with the people who were against apartheid, talking to them. And I know you uh, were interviewing a lot of the politicians. They were running their elections at that time. So I would love to hear how they spun things to, to walk the fence, because that's usually what politicians do. Mm -hmm. um, what was the mentality, was the mentality a lot different if you encountered any of the racist, white supremacists there in South Africa than the ones here? I mean, was it like 10 times worse? I can't imagine it being 10 times worse, but what was the difference? What 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 was it like? Because here in Evanston, um, and I won't just say here in Evanston, I, I personally only know a, a few, a handful of people from South Africa um, who are white. Um, and there is a vibe I get from them. There, there is a vibe I get, uh, and I, that's, I'll leave it there. <laughs> I'll leave it there. So, so, so I would say that we didn't encounter much of that because we weren't really in those places. I do think that South Africans are willing to have a more honest conversation about race than we are here in the United States. Mm -hmm. And remember, the racial categories there are different. So, you have black, colored and white, and then you have, um, you have, you have a large um, Indian population also in, in South Africa. And so they've been having these conversations about race for a long time. So I'm sure there are some, um, you know, white racists in South Africa, right? But 
um, we weren't around them, let, let me put it that way, or they didn't indicate that to us necessarily. I think, I think the thing that troubled me and still troubles me whenever I go to South Africa is just seeing the economic disparity, kind of what Dale described earlier of just the dramatic difference in the haves and the have nots. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, someone in the documentary reminded me that, you know, democracy is still very young in South Africa. Uh, remember, there are 11 official languages languages in South Africa. So they're trying to be as inclusive as possible of all the different um, ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. And I think that because of that, uh, because of having, having political power though is not enough. And I think we see that um, in South Africa and we see that here in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. um, that you've got to have economic power and that takes a lot longer, unfortunately. So, like I said, it's, it's very um, disappointing sometimes when I leave there going, wow. And I think, I think people have kind of forgotten. They think, oh, apartheid ended in 1994, they're all good. Well, they're not all good because we're not all good here in the United States. And we've been going at it, as, as Cheryl Johnson Odom says in the documentary, for more than 400 years, and we're not all good. And so to expect them to have re reached um, economic parity uh, just since 1994 is, is, is very unrealistic. It doesn't mean you don't continue to work toward it though. Dale, did you wanna add anything about what you saw? I mean, I think you summed it up. Um, I, I, you know, I mean, Johannesburg in some regards kind of reminded you of certain parts in Chicago. I mean, you know, the people uh, throughout the town, you know, they, they were, you know, they would go along their daily business, you know. Um, I don't know if we engaged in any political conversations um, while we were there. Uh, there. There was this conversation I had with, uh, with a white uh, South African uh, lady about this whole notion of how they uh, changed the language and, you know, uh, the, the whole things around in Afrikaans. Um, and that was a pretty deep discussion uh, about that where the uh, young people protested actually and, and said, hey, listen, you know, we don't want you coming into our schools and trying to, you know, change our native tongue, you know, to, um, to a language that, that's a more appeasing to, to you, you know, um, so, Back, uh, apartheid did a job on the people of South, the black people of South Africa. In some respects, you can make you can make an argument that it did uh, probably more of a job on them than racism did on us. I'm not comparing the two, but but there were a lot of things. You know, there were children who were killed because they were they protested. You know, that said, hey, you know, um, but yeah, they they. They try to strip away everything and, and build this whole new uh, education system that uh, that benefited the white South Africans. Um, we tend to stay away from that in the documentary, but this is only through observation having traveled there, you know, and their fight today continues. Uh, there's, there's a distinct difference between the young South Africans, the millennials, and the older South Africans. Um, the millennials think that they're not moving fast enough. So there's that divide. So there's some interesting dynamics that are happening in South Africa. And, you know, we, we don't want to speak for the entire uh, country of South Africa, but um, at least in Johannesburg, there were some things that were kind of glaring. Um, I mean, we, I guess if we had stayed longer, uh, we could have talked a little bit more about it, but um, uh, Again, the, the the poor. I mean, just think about the poorest section that you that you know of in 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 any area here, and it pales in comparison to what they live in. Some of the poorest uh, people and uh, who are black uh, live in in uh, Johannesburg. I mean, it, it was really sad to see, as I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. Well, it almost sounds the same. I know the, the their conditions are 10 times worse than ours, um, but it sounds the same in terms of economic. It, it does come down to economic power. And mm -hmm. we are still trying to attain that, many of us, uh, even right here in 
in Evanston, but you definitely see it in Chicago because Chicago is still one of the most segregated cities. I mean, you take a real estate course and that's the first thing they teach you on the first day is how segregated mm -hmm. and racist Chicago is in the real estate market. Um, I mean, that speaks volumes. That speaks volumes, right. You know, I, I hate to get into these comparison of atrocities, you know, uh, but they they are uh, uh, a ways behind, you know. I mean, you know, you can go. I mean, we we actually saw at one house that we visited. Um, uh, this was a, a white South African family who had invited um, uh, us over for dinner along with uh, the students Ava uh, uh, that we had with us. And this was like a four level home. It was an elevator in this home. This home had to be at least two or $3 million. I mean, that's how, and it was just really odd to see because they had maids and butlers, you know, like the maids had these wraps around their, their heads, you know, and it, it, it all, I mean, I was almost, it's almost like a time warp, you know. Uh, now, you know, again, I think they were live-ins, but uh, it, it was just, um, it was like, I don't know, seeing an old Gone with the Wind movie, you know, I mean, it was, it was just that glaring and, and I'm like, wow, you know, and, and, and this particular one we went to set up on this hilltop where you can kind of oversee the, the city of Johannesburg. I mean, we had to actually drive up an incline to get to it. So, so those are the type of things. The house that, on the hill. The house on the hill, those, those yeah. type of things that you'll see when you go there, you know. Interesting. Well, thank you all so much for sharing. I really want people to, to watch this documentary because um, I'm ready to dive in and learn some more. I mean, you know, I thought I knew so much about Mandela until I watched this documentary. I was like, wait, he didn't come to Chicago? No, why did he come to Chicago? What is going on? I know Chicago, you know, I hate to say it. We, we are the most beautiful city to me. I don't want to live anywhere else in the world. Chicago is beautiful. Evanston is beautiful. But there was a reason he left us off the list. <laughs> and I totally understood why. Um, gosh, I want to hear more. Is there going to be a part two? Was there well, let, let's get through the part in? one. Let's get through the part <laughs> one first. Um, again, I just want to remind people to tune in on Valentine's Day. That's this Sunday. February 14th at 4 p.m. on WTTW channel 11. Um, it's really important for people to tune in to these kinds of uh, programs because these television stations, they want to know that people are watching and that it's you know worth their time to do this kind of programming. So it's supposed to be cold. You can't really go anywhere. Uh, it's COVID. You're not supposed to be going anywhere. So that gives you a reason to be at home on the afternoon of Valentine's Day, cozy, you know, warm with your favorite beverage, maybe some popcorn, and then sit back, relax, watch the doc. And, you know, if, if you want more information or you want to submit some comments, you can go to mandelainchicago.com and you can put in your name and information. You could also send me an email at Northwestern University if you want to. You can look me up if you want to do that. Um, but we certainly um, hope that people will watch and that they will learn something as well and also share that information they learn with other people who may not have that information. Yes, yes. So give them the day and time again one more time in the station. This Sunday, February 14th, Valentine's Day at 4 p.m. Central, WTTW Channel 11. Yep, yeah, Malika, uh, one other thing real quick. So there's been a lot of uh, people who live outside of the Chicagoland area who, who's been asking about it. We're going to rebroadcast this online as well uh, around the 28th, I think, of February. So people outside of Chicago who can get, you know, obviously WTTW, they'll be able to uh, at least see the documentary. So, so we may be doing this a few times, you know, now that we're, you know, locked in for COVID. <laughs> so. Hopefully we won't be locked in forever though. At, at some point we can do some in-person screenings, maybe next year. Yeah. Probably not this year, but maybe next year. But remember this anniversary is gonna to continue to come. And in 2023, that will be the 30th anniversary of Nelson Mandela's visit to Chicago. So 
we hope that we can give people more education as we lead up to that anniversary. And again, every year it's going to be an anniversary of his release from prison. And that will be again this Thursday, February 11th, 1990. And so we're now, you know, it's, it's hard to believe, right, that it has been 31 years since he was released from prison. And so we still just want to keep it top of mind. Um, the impact that he had, not just on South Africa, but on the world. Mm -hmm. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. He is an inspiration still today. And so I thank you all so much for keeping his legacy going and opening it up for us to learn more and definitely to the new generation so that they understand, look, people have been fighting for a long time around this world for equality and justice. So thank Absolutely. you so much for that education. Absolutely. Thank you for having us. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. All right. You All know, right. and I didn't even open up for questions because I was, sorry people, that's the first time I ever did that. <laughs> I was all into it myself. Um, you got a comment there. Thank you for creating this documentary. All right, thank you. That's from Mary Sila, Sila, Sila. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, thank you. Yes, thank you all. Thank you, and I hope you'll watch. I certainly will. It's already on my calendar. All right, very good. Thank you. All right, Ava and Dell, thank you so much for right. Evans Live TV. And everybody, get out there and watch Mandela in Chicago. Right, and remember, you don't have to get out anywhere. Just stay home and watch. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. That is watch true. It. On right. Valentine's Day, they call it the labor of love. That's why it's being released on, on Valentine's, Valentine's Day, Day. And you all will really enjoy it. I've, I've seen it. I'm going to watch it again. It's really powerful. It's really powerful. Thank you so much, Malika. We okay. really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Take care, everybody. All right. Good night. Good night. This is Malika Evanston Live TV. You all be sure to stay tuned. We've got more candidates coming up. The election season is, is on. I thought it'd be great to break it up with something really powerful. Mandela in Chicago. You all got to check this out. It's a documentary by Evanstonians right here. Ava is the director, her husband, Dale, producer on the project. They've been to South Africa. This is something they've been working on for over four years. And it shows they put a lot of work a lot of passion into it and I really hope you all get something from it definitely it you will be inspired and informed so stay tuned here Evanston Live TV we have more amazing people in Evanston doing amazing things <laughs>